It's the Blue Room Summer Weekly, and uh, we're back with some Everton news. Uh, well, some Everton news picking up on the transfer window. Can you believe it? Uh, potentially a, a player coming towards Everton as well. I don't think, I can't remember when that last happened, to be honest with you. I've got Peter with me, I've got Paul with me, um, and we're, we're going to take a look at uh, the news that's been coming our way. I think the ownership, we've delved into it a little bit too far because we really seem to be getting excited about these things. And um, until somebody actually signs a piece of paper to say that they own Everton Football Club, I'm um, I'm quite inclined to not talk as much about it. Having said that, I'm um, I'm sort of lying a bit there because we covered it loads last week. So we'll wait and see what happens with the uh, with the, with the. Apparently, there's a there's a, there's a sale going on at Everton Football Club where there's lines and lines of people like it's Black Friday. Uh, trying to sign, trying to own the football club, but wait and see what happens there. Um, before we get underway, guys, um, obviously the sad news: uh, Kevin Campbell passing away. We did, we did a show on that last week, but um, I haven't had a chance to to speak to both of you about it. Um, I'll, I'll come first to you, Paul, because you spoke on BBC um, as you said, didn't you, Peter, about uh, Kevin Campbell passing away? And um, Paul, it was uh, it was so. I mean, it was so sudden for me, and we knew he was ill. Um, for quite some time, but um, one of those things that generally occurs when you don't hear much news for a while, and then you know it comes to fruition. And I think a lot of people have spent time to think back about Kevin Campbell and how important he was as as an Evertonian, and um, just want to get your views on him. And um, you know how, how tremendously sad it was that he passed away. Yeah, it was it was all good news, Dave. I think you know it, it was. One, although we knew he he was ill, it still came as a bolt out of the blue when, when the news finally broke that he had died. Now, and, and fifty four is such a young age for you know for, for someone to die. And I think as well, we always have this idea, don't we? Because you see footballers in their athletic prime, you kind of think you know they've, they've got the strength, the physique, the will to go on forever. So it does come as a bit of a shock, you know, when they die. And I think as well. As you get older, and I'm particularly speaking personally here, you always get more concerned. Yeah, you, know, you always get more shocked by a player who's younger than you dying prematurely. It, it really does hit home quite hard. And I don't think you can underestimate the impact Kevin Campbell made on Everton when he joined us at that time. When it seemed at towards the end of that season, we were struggling to to stay in the Premier League again, and then he just hit this run of goal scoring form that just totally lifted the spirits of of the whole fan base lifted the spirits of the players. And it was a massive, massive influence at a time when Everson needed needed a hero almost. And he was the one who arrived on town to deliver that. And I think he fell in love with the club. The club fell in love with him. He's always, always spoken so highly about his time and his experiences at Everson. And when you think he played for one of the top Arsenal teams in the 90s as well, it just shows how much he respected Everson, how much he respected the supporters. And every time we watched them, on any of the sports analysis programmes, whenever he was a guest on Everson programme, he always spoke so highly about the team. He was always so positive. And you, you really, you, you would love to have a younger version of Kevin Campbell in that Everson team now. Someone who just lights up the dressing room, someone who would just lift everyone with his buoyancy, with his spirits, with his enthusiasm, with his positivity. I thought it was really good listening to some of the stories that Alan Myers came out with about yeah. Kevin Campbell, which hadn't been, hadn't been aware of before. But the way he kind of stuck up for the underdog, the way he'd support people when they needed support. And he he, he just seems to tick every box of what makes a wonderful human being. Great footballer, wonderful human being, great Evertonian, and a huge loss, not just to Everton, but to the football world as well. And you only have to look at the comments from other teams he and supporters of other teams he played for, such as Arsenal, Nottingham Forest, and Carlos City, West Bromwich Albion. And they were all effusive in their praise for him. So for someone to create that impression, such a positive leaves such a positive legacy on so many different clubs throughout his career just speaks volumes for the integrity and the brilliance of the man. Uh, I think that's a spot on. Um, the eulogy you've just given about him, I think, uh, Paul, because I've worked with him a few occasions. He's been on with us here in the Blue Room a few times as well. And um, he's just he was just full of bags of energy as well. If you look at the social media, he did every single day, it was like, you know, attack the day and he put like a an emoji of sunshine and blue hearts and all that stuff. Um, I'm always really enthusiastic about the sport himself. He loved football too. Um, and Pete, just a, just a quick way, because I know you've spoken a lot about this. I mean, um, just just what I wanted to ask you was, you know, you think, I, I think a lot of people took it for granted when he scored the, what was it, nine in eight games to keep us up. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, to come in and do that, 
from the issues he had with Trabs on Spur over in Turkey. Um, for him to come back and <clears throat> I think I, I never I haven't read this or, or seen anything or you know spoke to anybody about it, but how he eventually come about joining Everton. The comments, the the clip I think I put out on our social media the other day with him saying that sometimes you find a club that you click with, and Everton's the one that he that, that became his, and that's how he sort of grown to end up loving us. Um, but you think back to that first season when he came in on loan, that was that was some going that those goals he scored when we were absolutely on the floor, effectively. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously not on his own, kept us up, but a huge part of keeping us in the Premier League. Yeah, and, and especially when you consider he, he signed in April. It wasn't like the yeah. old, you know, sort of January, January signed, you know, or, the, or what happens now where you've got the January transfer window. He signed in April. And I think, I mentioned this the other day when I, when I was on the uh, the Radio Mail side thing, I said, like, I don't think we knew what what type of player we were getting at the time. Because like you say, he'd had so, so many issues over in Turkey. He hadn't played for for a number of, a number of months. He was, um, we didn't know how long it was going to take him to come back and readapt to the Premier League and and what sort of impact he'd make. It was almost like a bit of a last throw of the dice. Uh, but the way the way he just hit the ground run was, was incredible. Um and I mentioned as well the other day about like, you know, we'd lost Duncan Ferguson earlier on in that season and how much of a, a huge hole that left, not just in terms of on the pitch, but off the pitch as well. Not having someone to idolise, uh, it's it can't be underestimated how important it is to have have a have a focal point, have a have a as Paul just said, a hero in the side. And I think that Kevin came in and and did that, and and it, it, it's just awful. I'm absolutely he was he was one of my original heroes, you know, like my, one of my big, you know, when you talk about your favourite players, um, I think I've you know said before, you know, you've got Konchelskis, Ferguson. Timmy Cale's up there. Kevin Campbell is 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 there. You know, you know, he's if anyone sort of our generation, my generation, he he was an absolute mm. hero um, and a great person as well. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah, that, that that's the thing about it. it's funny, isn't it? When you go back through those plays you mentioned there that have stuck out, you think, do you know, what? if only we had other decent plays around, them, we'd actually be a really good side. When you think about, because some yeah. of them have been top quality. I mean, mine's always been Kinchelskis, as many people know. Listen to any show that we've done. I adored him, meeting him and interviewing him was like, you know, I felt like a kid at Christmas and nearly went home and started skipping around the house and everything when I spoke to him. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, rest in peace, Big Kev. The, the, what they've done in front of the, the club as well, in front of Goderson looks yeah. brilliant. The big picture of that. both his hands in the air, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, On that note as well, Dave, I know the yeah. 1878s um, are doing a, a, a fundraiser because the, the, there are going to be plans in place for the first game of the season to... Uh, to pay tribute to Kevin Campbell, mm-hmm. so if anyone if anyone wants to uh, wants to donate to that, there's a link up on the on the eighteen seventy eight Twitter uh, page now. Yeah, we'll get all that out on on social media as well, and obviously a tremendous thing they do every season for what's going on at the Blues, and um, yeah, I think the least Super Kev deserves there, doesn't he? Um, moving on to news that have come in transfer wise, which you know feels weird to say those things, like I said at the start of this show. Um, first thing, I'm going to struggle about a name uh, who we've been linked with here. And it feels like we're sort of Aston Villa's best mates here all of a sudden talking about players. Mm. Um, We'll go with the one that looks like he's coming our way first. Um, Various sources have said that it could actually happen today. Please, uh, listeners and you two guys, tell me if this is wrong the way I'm saying it. I've even been been on YouTube Listening, you know, when you just go on that thing, pronounce, and it's just got some random voice saying the name. I've been on here for like 10 minutes trying to keep it in my mind. So his first name's Tim, and I think that's yeah. what I'll call him if, yeah, if, he, actually, if he actually signs. But, like Billy, As- yeah. Billy Asinov, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what did he say? He said, just call me Billy when he first arrived. Billy, yeah, that was it, yeah. yeah. This guy is called Tim Eero Bungnam. That's, that's the translation that I've... Uh, I've come to anyway by hearing these uh, various comments on the internet and whatnot. Um, but I was looking a bit about what kind of player he is. Uh, he's 20 years old. He's uh, only played 12 games for Aston Villa. And that was back in 2022. He's been on loan at QPR, played 32 times for them in the season gone by. Uh, sorry, the season before, the one that's just gone by. Uh, England under 19s, England under 20s, midfield player. Um, and look, it's hard to, to go deep into 
what young players are going to be like. He's had he's had a little look in the Premier League. He's done a full season in in the Championship, which is you know, it's uh, not that comfortable, not that easy to do to go down the Championship and and play that amount of games. Certainly at the age of nineteen, twenty. Um, first with you, Paul. I think this might be the sort of the tone we have this summer. Um, is obviously players that we don't have to effectively pay much, if anything, for. Um, I did say that we do need to have a look in the championship. This is not quite that because he's an Aston Villa player, but he was in the championship himself. Um, looks like he's going to be an Everton player. Um, we'll talk about the opposite end of that with what's going on with Lewis Dobbin uh, after that. But what's your feelings toward this one? Actually getting a player in, has that made you, uh, made you smile straight away as we need to sort out our finances in, what, 10 days' time? Um, how do you feel about this one? Well, I think I think I think like most of the day, came as a shock to think Robert might be bringing a player in during the window because you know, <laughs> it, you, all the stories get about our financial plight. You kind of think we're not bringing anybody in, but yeah, it, it's it, there's a couple of factors here. I, I guess one, it, it kind of shows that the market we're kind of operating in in that we can't afford to go and splash big money on players, so we're having to do these deals on the never never as per Chimisi, as per Beso, and straight away that that limits the field of players. You you can start to cruise on that basis. So given the the way we're operating at the moment, it probably fits the, you know, the the, the process type of play we're going for because I think he's a young player, he's got potential, he's played a few games in Premier League. And like you, I, I agree we should be looking at players in the Championship a little bit more because I think there's some really good players there who, you know, given the opportunity of Premier League level, can go on and prove themselves rather than sort of being bewildered by sort of, uh, signings who might have a glamorous name and play for a glamorous club, but don't actually sound to be that good when they come across the Premier League. So I'm, I'm quite old for that. He's young, so you're always taking a gamble with young players, aren't you? So it, you know, I think Kevin Thelwell's kind of said in the past, hasn't he? Our model now is to buy young at, at, at a reasonable fee, sell high a few years later when the, these players have developed. So if he can come in and make a contribution to the team, if he can come in and make an impact with the team, then I, I'm, I'm quite for that. I'm kind of looking at James Garner, someone similar whose experience was yeah. in the chapter as well, haven't played many signs for the Premier League, but has come in and, in my view, uh, has has done quite well for the club last season. So if, if that's kind of a comparison to go by, that, that I'm, quite, I'm quite pleased with that. I mean, I'd be lying if I, if I came across as, as an expert on Tim here and give you all sorts of stats and details about his career. But he's, he's played for the England under-19s, I believe. He's played for the England under-21s. If you've survived a season of the Championship, you've shown you can cope with the vigours of English football. So it, it's it's not it's not a signing to take the breath away. It's not a signing that is going to sell another 100,000 replica shirts in the club shop. But it's somebody new. It's a, it's an addition to the squad, and I think one area of the team last season where we desperately needed reinforcements was midfield. And I think in terms of recruitment, it, the, the the decision to sign him makes sense. I, I mean, I'm just reading some various bits and pieces from various sources here. I mean, it's, you know, a few of them are saying a fee of up to around ten million pounds. I mean, I'm not I'm not too sure what where that's come from. Um, you know, maybe people are thinking that we've got the owners in by then and we can go and buy whoever we like. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure that's going to happen because we have to sort this financial issue out before the end of this month. Otherwise, there's um, more point deductions on the horizon, I think. Um, what got me with it a little bit here, Pete, is that I, I don't look at Sean Dice as a manager that particularly favours young players. Um, if it looks like we're one we're buying here, I would like to think he's on board with what's going on with, with Kevin Thelwell. Um, I would love to know behind behind closed doors what that relationship's actually like between the two. Because it's obviously there'd be major issues that we had with, with various managers and um, directors of football. Um to go for the lad, I mean if this if this is a well, if this is any sort of fee right now, it's a it's a raise of your eyebrows, isn't it? Um a midfield player as well. Still plenty of rumors going on with Amadou Onana. Um Midfield, an area that you think, other than you know, are the ones that probably come to mind a little bit more regarding defensively getting a striker in, perhaps a midfield player. Is that something you'd be putting at the top of this list? Well, I think I think one thing it, it will do is it'll free up that space if we were to then sell at Amadou Onana, which I think is is vital for us this season or this summer to sell Onana. Um, I think he's one of our most saleable assets. I think we can. I don't think we'll make massive profits on him because there's also a sell-on fee 
Um, I know that there's a sell on fee. I was, I was actually talking to somebody about this. The sell on fee, it's not actually the entire fee, is it? It's what you make above the 30 million we, we're paying for it. So, for instance, we get the 30 million, then they take 10%, whatever the percentage is, after the fee we receive. So, I, if we sold it for 40 million, it's in the 10 million that they get a percentage from, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a percentage on the profit. So, I think That's it's right, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so it's like it's like a percentage on on top of. So that doesn't mean we've actually we've still got effect, if we sell them for the same fee, we've still got around thirty million we paid for them. That made me feel a little bit more easy than thinking whatever yeah. fee we get, we're giving a big chunk of it back to um, clubs that he's been involved with. And these just seem deals to happen all the time now, don't they? Um, but well, anyway, just just, go, think... just going back to Tim there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one one good one reason why it makes sense in terms of. I think both deals seem to be linked as well with Lewis Dobbin going the other way. I know you said you want to talk about him shortly. Yeah. But it the 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 big main positive for both of these deals is in terms of PSR. Um because we don't actually outlay the money straight away for Tim, but Villa can put it on their books as receiving ten million basically. They 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 put it down as ten million and because it's an academy player, it's pure profit. So it goes fully towards PSR, even though the money doesn't necessarily come in straight away. It actually goes down as a ten million pound sale. Um, now for us, but then for us, it won't go out as a ten million pound buy, if you know what I mean, because it's spread out over the over the course of however many years. Five or a week, and it'll or come, yeah, exactly. So so <laughs> it won't actually it won't actually come out for us as one big lump sum. Whereas when we receive the money, it does go down as a as one big lump sum sale, basically. Um, so I think the reverse thing of that is Lewis Dobbin going the other way. I know a few people have raised eyebrows, but again, I I personally think that it's the right model to be to be doing. Develop young players, move them on for for pure profit on PSR, bring more young players in for for reasonable fees. Hopefully, develop them, and then either they hit the, you know they play fantastic well, fantastically well for Everton, and then you sell them for huge profit, um, or if you know, if they don't necessarily do do as well as you, you'd hope, it's not that ma- massive a fee to have forked out on them. So I think it's it's the right model to be going down. Um, I think looking at his attributes, I, I mean, you, you can't. I'm very cautious when I see YouTube highlight reels. Oh, I knew someone um, I was think... going to say YouTube. I was just about to say the same thing myself. I've just been looking, you know, looking for his name and how you pronounce it. First thing next to it is how good he is on FIFA. And you know you can see like twenty minutes of him like passing the ball and stuff like that. Yeah, I I, I think I'm very cautious when it comes to YouTube highlight reels. And one of the ones I remember was who man who man he asked. Do you remember that? I remember his highlight reels and looking the at his is, highlight you know, reels. The, the problem is the highlight reels, which by by the definition of what they are, you see the best of these people. You don't see the worst of them, <laughs> no, <laughs> which tends to have been the most prominent thing that's happened when we've signed these players. Well, that's it. I remember, but well, I remember with you, man. He asked the funny thing about that was his highlight reels were weren't that good either. But we still <laughs> we still sat and remember looking at a thing. And is that is that his highlights? You know what I mean? But yeah. um, I think one thing that this lad does seems to have just. I mean, one thing you can judge someone on is their attributes in terms of their mm. physical attributes. Do you know what I mean? You know, you can see the the the, the size of someone. You can see their sort of style of play, if you like. Um, he does, you know, remind me very much so of 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 Amadou Onana in a sense that he's very tall. He he gets his foot in. He looks like he wants to be on the ball as well. He looks like he wants to receive the ball, you know, on the half turn if you like, um, and carry the ball forward. But again, it's it's difficult to to get a full picture of of what he does over a ninety minutes spell, you know, yeah. going off highlights. But but certainly in terms of his attributes, I think he's got. He seems like he's got a lot to him, and certainly and also. Worth noting that the Villa fans seem to be really disappointed that he's leaving as well, which is always yeah. a good sign. Well, Unai Emery played him for well, basically the third part of a the season. Then, you know, if he's somebody who, who endorses him, then you know that's that's no bad thing, given how well he's done getting Aston Villa to the, the Champions League. Um, the other way, Paul, uh, the, the Peter alluded to there is Lewis Dobbin, probably going the other way. Um. I've got a couple of feelings on this, and the, the first one would be the initial thing I said about Sean Dice with young players. Um, now, I think the massive caveat with him not being 
uh, proactive, shall we say, in putting young players out there is given the limitations Everton had. As in, I think many managers would trust the players that they've seen for the majority of their career, the ones that are experienced, i.e. Tarkovsky, you've got to put them in first and foremost before you start giving younger players. We've seen it with Chimiti as well, didn't we? Um, with and, and I felt that Dobbin paid the price for that in, in many ways. Uh, you know, we've seen him come on, we've seen him score that great goal, we've seen him do exactly what we'd all do as kids. You know, you can't wait to get home and tell all your mates and your family and go out afterwards and things like that. Um, seemed to have real talent. Now, are we dipping into the unknown here by effectively swapping him for a player we've never seen before? Or do you feel like, like Pete said there, in terms of players we have to let go, would you see Dobbin as somebody who's on that list where it wouldn't cost us as much as, let's say, you know, an Onana might do? Let's say, you know, let's hope not, but, you know, a, a Carvet Lewin and, you know, I'm not going well, I'm going to mention his name once, but Brantwaite as well. Um, <laughs> certainly, you know, you, he's he's the lesser of two evils, really, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll agree with both, with both what you and uh, Peter have said there as well. I, I, I think financially, we were in a situation where if a club comes, comes in for, for an offer with one of our promising young players, then in terms of PSR, you know, we'll, we'll, sadly, we'll, we're going to have to take the money that's on the table. Um, yeah, I mean, and we, we talk about Lewis Dobbin extensively on, on this pod, haven't we? We all we'll, we'll, we'll kind of have a feeling that maybe, you know, Sean Dice, for whatever reason, hasn't, has underused them, hasn't developed them as a player. And it seems quite clear that, you know, the fact he hardly figured last season will kind of give you the feeling that he's not going to figure much next season under yeah. Sean Dice anyway. So if it's just going to be a case where his only contribution to Everson next season is going to be five minutes off the bench every third or fourth game. Then if he's not going to play and someone's prepared to pay money for him, then you know, if you look at purely as a financial deal, then it makes sense. And sadly, I mean, these days in football, we don't actually talk about players anymore. We just talk about their financial worth and how much money you bring into the club. You know, I really want to go back to a time when football was more important than the finances. I want to, no, I want to go back to the Kevin Campbell days when he came yeah, away yeah. talking about what a great footballer Kevin Campbell was, rather than what would his resale value, value be, how much could he get? We sort of want to best a club. So it just kind of shows that the market we're in at the moment. It almost seems with Everson, the moment that you're more concerned about who, you know, which lawyer we're going to sign this summer, which which creative accounts we're going to bring in the summer rather than yeah. the players. Are they going to be our key signings? It's just seen the whole game has moved on from talking about football, talking about finance. And you know, it's inevitable because you can't these days deal with football without touching on the finance aspect. But yeah, the Lewis Dobbin thing, yeah, I just think you know, he's not going to play regularly for Everson. If someone wants to buy him, then take the money. Um, you know, it, it's a gamble, as Pete has pointed out there, about bringing Tim in. But the other perfect scenario would be he comes into Everson, he does really well, the club does really well, and he might decide, hang on, this is a club going place. I might actually want to stay here rather than get sold on somewhere else. So that's kind can, of can, can the scenario you, you'd really prefer. But yeah, you, you know, look at you know, uh, Ella Sim, Tom Cannon, who we sold during the summer, and I had my reservation about both of those sales. I think Ellis Sim has gone on to show he can score goals, particularly in the Championship. I think Tom Cannon's had a bit of an in- injury hit season, so so maybe sending him 10 has to be quite a good move in retrospect. But it's just the market we're in at the moment. Uh, in, I, I, have a th- I was wondering about Sean Dyke as well. Do you think he's the type... I know he, he doesn't appear to trust young players particularly. Do you think he's the type of manager who, if he's brought a young player than himself, he's quite supportive of. But if he's inherited a certain young player that maybe he doesn't trust in the way he just likes of his experience players, well, I'm not quite sure on that one. I think I think that's a really good question. And and I think that I mean it it's hard to throw a fact of what he's been like. But um, you know, I, I think back to his, his Burnley days when that has been, you know, probably even more limited than what we are, uh, in terms of being able to put in some younger players when you can do, but that's the only thing that you can do. Um, that goes back to what I was saying. Like, I, I do wonder the work that he's going to be doing with Kevin Thelwell, and it, it is going to be shared opinion on what they should be going out and doing, and you know, coupled with the, the financial things as well. Um, I don't know it, if this is just my own opinion towards him because I haven't really got the fabric to go delve too deep about what he's done with his career, Sean Dice, with young players. But I, I do from what he's been with us. He hasn't decided to do that. But again, like I say, the massive caveat is he's had to go with tried and tested simply to keep us in the Premier League. Um, in, in regards to players coming in now, um, you know, 
the promised land for most clubs is you you get a young a young player in at worst you polish them and sell them for a lot more than you've bought them for. I am going to mention his name um, as much as I don't want to because we've got what well, ten days to go to sort out PSR. I think I'm right in saying that, aren't I, Pete? Um, we've got to we've got to do something about it anyway, otherwise we're into that that dreaded uh, zone that we were in yesterday uh, last season. Sorry, with, uh, with with the finance and deductions and whatnot. Um, the ridiculous offer from Manchester United seems to go on. I think they came out and said that. Everton's header in the clouds or something. That's not verbatim. He said something similar to that. Um, but, you know, that's ultimately what I've had in my mind. I think many Blues are the same. It's either him or it's Onana that are the, the, the big money we can get for, effectively. Yeah. I, I, well, I think Man United needs to be realistic. It, it, the, the, the word that seems to be leaking out of Manchester United is that if Everton want to sell, then they're going to have to be realistic. Well, we don't want to sell, do we? Like, do you not, so... do you not think that if you take your Everton hat off and you wear Man United, or, I mean, it's, it's obvious to say, isn't it? If you're another club that wants a top class player or potentially a top class player, um, obviously we, we, we think the former ourselves, we'll surely be trying to buy him as cheap as possible. You'd be trying to go into the club that is in a desperate financial situation and get him on the cheap. I mean, you can't, you can't blame United for doing that, can you? And that's exactly what we'd be trying to do if we were in that side of things. But, and I, I might get slated for saying that on this part, but when when you look at, we know, I think it's more a, a personal feeling, a, an emotional feeling towards Branthwaite because for once we're able to say that, and I, I mean that, that phrase there in terms of being able to polish them, he's been the diamonds that we've actually taken from the rough and made into a top class player. Um, that you know, you, for many people, would probably say she'll be at the Euros right now for England. Um, somebody who's going to be a world class, you know, saying he's going to be better than John Stones. Um, putting a lot of pressure on his shoulders, of course, but he looks like he's just taking everything in stride. Seeing him go for the fact that Everton need to do so for PSR issues. That's where it's that. That's where it hits me in the stomach a lot more than the rest of it, really. It does, yeah, but at the same time, Everton Football Club have got a duty to, you know, to, to make sure that we get the most money for them as possible. I don't think it makes sense long term to sell someone at half their value, but certainly not at half the value that that you set on them. Um, I think that Manchester United coming in with these derisory offers, it reminds me of when they came in for Baines and Fellaini and for yeah, 27 yeah. million ended up paying 28 just for Fellaini alone. Um, I think Everton. I think the days need to be gone where Everton are a soft touch with transfers. Um, we, people always lord Brighton for their for their incredible setup at Brighton, where they develop players and sell them for huge profits. Um, you know the, the amount, the figures that they that they were talking that was a KC that was over a hundred million. Yeah, I'm not being funny, but Jared Brantwaite, Jared Brantwaite is worth whatever whatever Everton value him at. Um, whether they, if he's trying to say that it's you know in this market in this sort of thing, I don't care. You, you, you pay the money that Everton wants, or or you find someone else. It's that simple. It's well, that just simple. To, just to put that, just to anyway, just to put that towards Paul Lee, I completely get with what you're saying there, Pete. But we we hand we we we've got our basically our hands behind our back with this, haven't we? Because he, he well, that's what that, that's what I mean. Has I, I to be sold. I don't think he does have to be sold though. That's the point, and I think I think that. When you, well, the, if, sorry, if you interrupt again, what what people put to me when I said he has to be sold, and Paul come into this uh, uh, as soon as uh, as soon as Pete finishes answering this, but you've got a issue where people will say, well, I don't care, I'd take the points reduction deduction because you've got a player there that if we keep him, we could see it off anyway. Pretty much what we did last season, which ultimately looks like it was comfortable in the end, given our running. But it wasn't, let's be fair, until we got to the last half a dozen games. Everton were fighting it, seriously fighting it, a relegation, um, as we have done the past three seasons. Maybe I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here, but when people are saying, oh, I'll take that deduction anyway because we've got a world-class defender to throw in there, can you really, you can't put a price on a defender and how many points you gain and or lose. So given the PSR situation, Surely that's priority over everything else. I mean, I, I, do you think? Do you agree with that? Well, I, I, th I think Dave, the, the the PSR situation in terms of points deductions, right? 
we don't know what a point deduction is going to look like, do we, at this stage? So if your yeah. argument says the point deduction is going to be two to three points, then I can understand the logic of that, that it might be worth taking the hit and keeping your best player if you're only going to lose two to three points. I think the counter argument that is the, this season, the three teams that went down were so poor compared to the rest of the league table yeah, that we, we can't yeah. bank on that again next season. And I think as well that um, Leeds, sorry, the Southampton, Leicester, and Ipswich are going to be really strong teams next season, uh, well back financially, good managers, good players. So it's going to be a tough battle again next season to, to stay in the Premier League. And I just don't like the negativity of starting off the, of starting off the season with points deduction. Now, I think Leicester might be due a points deduction, might they? So that, yeah. that's something that might yeah. work in our favour. But in, in terms of your answer, uh, the question you, you put there, you know, are we in a situation where we have to sell Brantley? Well, I think Pete kind of indicates some of the some of the options there. I think given the choice, we'd sell Onana over Branthwaite. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. I just think as well, you know, <laughs> you, you always look at the impact of, of selling of your brightest young plus prospects to other clubs. So look, look at Man United. When they took Rooney off us, I don't know about you two, but I was just absolutely devastated. And that that's kind of to me is a watershed moment that we were wow. no longer. I, Paul, I was I was crying that that, 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 um, that Euro twenty twenty four when he ripped it apart. I was yeah, I, I was crying watching absolutely. him do what he did. And you're there watching the he's an Everson player playing for England and absolutely turned the back out of all the Euro's best players. And so, so when Dan, he went, he's not mentioned Dan and things like that. <laughs> and so you look at Brantley thinking you know, to me he's one of the best defenders in the Premier League. You know, and defense is vitally important if you want to have a good team in, in the league. So to lose somebody like him. I just think it'll be a devastating blow. And it would just set the season off in the wrong mind, mindset for me and from the sports base as well in our last season at Goodison Park, where of all the seasons when you want the best Everton team to be turning out week in, week out, this is the season that you want this to happen at Goodison Park. So I think we have to look at every possibility of keeping Bradford. And I, I agree with you, uh, with you and Peter. I think United are trying to play this game. I don't like clubs that, that conduct transfer business in the media, get criticised and selling clubs for not meeting the place. No. It's from the from the Daniel Levy kind of school of transfer negotiations. Yeah, it's a good point. I th- yeah. And I suppose the other question as well is, I mean, how certain is it that Brantford would be attracted to a move to Man United? A, it's a club in chaos. B, apart from the odd cup victory, did those show no signs of, of, of winning the Premier League in recent times. The manager's tenure is uncertain there. It seems to be a deeply unhappy club. I mean, I'm sure... If Jaden Sancho gave Brantley a quick phone call and gave him an insight into how it, life is on the ten hard, it might have an influence on Brantley's thinking as well. So I'm not totally convinced that he wants to go. And uh, in terms of the market value of, of players, I mean, you mentioned uh, Brighton their piece as well. How about Fafana, who Chelsea bought from Leicester, paid about eighty odd million for him? I don't think he's already played this season. Yeah. So you know, thirty five million for Brantley is an absolute joke. If you're nice they're going to get him for that price, I'm sorry, you 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 really are sadly mistaken there. And um, there's other avenues we can explore to ensure we remain compliant with NPSR. One of which is hiring a bloody good. <laughs> Well, that's it. I mean, we're just going to finish. Are you guys still free to do 10 more minutes or so when you've had a little drink because it's going to yeah, stop yeah. in a sec? You all right for that? Yeah. The, the only other thing I was going to say that, I mean, it's <clears throat> footballers are only the value of what your team thinks they are. I mean, if he stayed, I mean, I, I have to say, you guys might disagree with this. Um, and just give me a quick answer on that, Pete, in a sec. I'd be astonished if he's still an Everton player come the start of the season against Brighton. No, I think I I think we'll he'll still be there. Think I think so? unless 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 a big offer comes in, I don't think I don't think he leaves genuinely. Unless because his value is not going to drop for me, it, 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 he's he's safely gonna gonna still command the big transfer fee in January or next summer. I don't think we should be in any rush whatsoever to sell him. Um, I think it's less like I think it's more likely we'll sell Dominic Calvert Lewin than than we actually will end up selling Branthwaite. Hmm. Right, cool. I'm going to stop this, lads. Go and get yourself a cuppa, and I'll drop you another link in about five, ten minutes. Cheers, gents. Cheers. So, players there, the interesting one that Pete mentioned, I thought there, Paul, was uh, was Calvert-Lewin. Now, this is a difficult situation as well, because he's got a year, long, a year left in his contract. Um, I think this has gone by the way, so for many, given everything else that's going on that we've already spoken about, and towards like the going towards the end of the podcast, it's the only time we've mentioned them really, but um, seeing various bits and pieces about him, the clubs may be interested and probably can get get him on the cheap as well, given the fact that he's only got, he's only got a year left. Um, 
I said something really controversial. Um, it's not like me, is it? <laughs> a, a, a few <laughs> weeks ago, saying that I wouldn't blame Dominic Calvert Lewin if he wanted to leave Everton, and the reason being that I think he's he struggled given his fitness. Obviously, um, I don't think that's the end we'll see of his of his fitness in, in, in of his injury issues because. You know, why, why, why would you, when it's happened, the, the majority of his career, he's had something that's set him back a little bit. Um, the, the other side of it as well is he's been absolutely slated by a lot of Evertonians for quite some time now, um, certainly over the last couple of years. He's not an Evertonian. And that's the thing. first thing that normally comes to my mind when you think that a player always should be staying. If they're not an, an attached, have an attachment to the club, you know, I might be completely wrong saying this, given what we referred to Kevin Campbell, um, bless him at the start of this pod. Um, but I don't think you get that as much these days where you get players who come into your club and completely you know, fall in love and adore themselves to it. I think that sort of happens if there's no other club that are coming for them, really. So you know, it's easy then to think, oh, I love the place where I'm at because I'm not going to be asked to go anywhere else. Um, with, with this, with, with Dom, I think it's an interesting one because, again, that thing top of the list, fee-wise, I mean, if somebody came in, there's a lot of links with Newcastle recently as well, um, because the injury, I run off the injury issues they have with Callum Wilson, um, who they adore up there. Um, this one for me, I don't think we can afford to go out to get a striker. It's Dominic Calvert Lewin is crucial to keep. Um, am I right in saying that, Paul? Well, I think we talked this before, haven't we, David? And the one commodity that most teams are looking for are strikers who can score goals. Yeah. And I think Calvert Lewin, when fit, has shown he's got propensity to score goals. I mean, certainly towards the end of this season, his contribution in the finals of ten games or so made a massive difference. Us being safe this season, so it, it, it's to me, <clears throat> you, you don't <clears throat> you don't sell one of your strikers unless you've got a ready-made replacement in the ranks. I don't think we have a ready-made replacement in the ranks. I don't see Besso particularly fulfilling uh, Calvert-Lewin's shoes next season. And also as well, it's not just the goals. You lose that experience in, in the team as well. Someone who's, who, who's been in these situations before, who's played in the big games, who knows the expectations of the crowd. Yeah. And I take your point that he's not every Evertonian's flavour of the month. But then again, most Evertonians uh, have a, a, have an issue with certain players, not a team. At uh, any Good stage, when you can look at Tom Davis, Ross Barkley, John Joe Kenny, all these players have all been through the mill. So I'm sure the players these days must really just kind of take any notice of what, what these opinions are about them because you wouldn't survive in modern life if you listen to all the stuff on social media. So if you put me on the spot, yeah, I, I would keep him. I, I'd keep him for another 12 months because I don't think we can afford to lose a striker. And definitely we cannot afford to lose Carver Lewin and Branthwaite in the same transfer window. There's actually no way that situation could be allowed to, to take place. So, yeah, money is taught. I mean, you know, if, say for argument, say Newcastle to come up with, with a, a, a totally stupid bid, then you'd have to look at it. But I, I think this is one of the cases when how do you measure someone's goals? How do you make? We don't score many goals anyway, and then to take away one of our most potent strikers to me just seems a very, very unnecessary risk to take for Everton at this moment. So I'd be inclined to give them another season, and then you know maybe the end of next season, depending on where we are as a club, then we might be in a better situation to to release them. But you wouldn't be top of my list of players to sell. I, I, I'm definitely with Peter. I, I think if Onana goes before. If Onana's our next big sale, I'm more than happy with that with that outcome. Yeah, and I I agree with that in general. But the the only thing I include in in that chat about Calvert Lewin is he's got a year left. Um, yeah, I'm, that's the issue. The, got, the big issue. Yeah, we, and, we can't and afford. We can't afford. The main thing go about it. Yeah, this is the main thing about it. You've got that. You've got PSR as well. Like I say, you know, you've got what best part of ten days to sort this out. You know, if someone like Newcastle came in and said, we'll give you 15, 20 million, Everton can't turn that down. I don't think they'd have that. Same as the, the sort of debate we were having before about, you know, you keep Branthway out at all costs, regardless of what we get in terms of deductions. Um, I I think that's something you could discuss and debate all day long, really. Um, it, it, it'd be a hard, it's a hard question to ask because you wouldn't know what deduction you'd get. Um, you know, people, you know what you're saying there, Paul, if it's two, three, four points... You think having Branthwaite certainly outweighs getting rid of him so you don't get the deduction. Um, I perfectly accept that. But, you know, when you come to one that we ultimately do have to let go, I mean, what amount is it? Does anybody know what actual amount of money we need here oh. to not get done, for want of a better term? 
it depends. It depends on on the amortis. What? How do you say amortis? Amort amortisation. Amortisation. That's the one. That's yeah. the one. I've read it a thousand times. I've never actually said it out loud. It's like but, me um, with Yeah, it's. Um, I think it depends on on how that goes. But we're still waiting on on this commission. I don't even think we've got a date yet for it, which is ridiculous when you think about it. Um, considering if if we are able to appeal that and we are, and we do win um, our arguments, then the figure basically we're compliant. Now, if we're not compliant, I think the talking between ten and twenty million um, it, it is. Around there, so so again, talking about Calvert Lewin and, and and the difference, it's it's two ends of the spectrum, isn't it? Because you've just got Grant Fleet on one. Sorry, mate. Just before you continue with that, that reference to it. Sorry, to interrupt as usual. But the <laughs> new owners don't have a play in this whatsoever, do they? Because it's not, not like they, moment, they, it's not like they could yeah. turn up, sign Everton today, and then that's it, clean slate. That's not possible, no, is but, it? Uh, not for not for. This season's P or, or you know this, this year's uh, PSR financially, unless he can do some, unless we can we can get some sponsorship deals through it's all very very sharpish. But I think I think in terms of say with Brandweight and Calvert Lewin, the two ends of the, of the spectrum because you've got Brandweight who's on a long term deal. He's got you know he's got four was is it four years three years left on his contract. Oh, yeah. So in other words, his, his value isn't going to drop. Dominic Calvert Lewin has got one year on his contract by all accounts. We've offered him a new contract as well. And he hasn't signed it. So does he is he holding out for more money for a longer contract? And if so, can we afford to be giving him 100, 140, 150 grand a week? I don't think we can. I don't think we can we can give that type of foot that, that type of money to someone who has got such a such an injury record. I understand that obviously he does make a difference when he's fit and firing. I, I really do rate Dominic Calvert Lewin. Um but at the same time, I don't think we can afford one, we can't afford him to to see out his contract and leave on a free, and, and secondly, I don't think we can afford to be paying him over the odds. Um, and if and if that's what he's after, and he's after more money than we can afford to give him, then it's unfortunately it's only going to go one way. Having said that, if we lose Calvert Lewin and keep Brantwaite, I think that you know there are deals to be done out there in terms of. I think we've been linked with someone from the from the um, from the French league today, haven't we? Is it in Dai, um, who we who we were we were linked with a few years ago. I think we've been linked with a low move for him. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to happen, isn't there? But like you say as well, you've, I mean, Beto Schmitty's coming, coming through as well. Um, I, I do like the look of that lad. I think that long term, I think Schmitty will be, you know, has got so much potential. Uh, I think he's shown glimpses of what he can potentially do. Um, but yeah, it, it, I, I'd, my preference would be if it was between Brantwaite losing Brantwaite or Calvert Lewin this summer. My preference. Preference will be keep brand to it. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Peter. I mean, if it's as simple as that, it's a no brainer in that case, isn't it? But I think I, I'm still with you on the original point that if it comes to a case of Onana or Brantway going this summer, then I think to me it's Onana. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And you put it, you put him ahead of uh, Calvert Loon as well. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Mm. It, what, what interested me and in what you've both said there, I mean, I, I think the scenario plays out that if you're desperate to keep Calvert Lewin and you reject the you know, just the and I'm plucking a, an amount in the in the air of say twenty million from, from a new regardless who it's from, you know, a, a team that's in the Premier League, twenty million and you reject that, you're playing the issue then of well, he's not gonna he's probably not going to sign a new contract. Um unless he's given a silly amount, which probably well um, Definitely, it's not going to happen that Everton have the amount to put that sort of um, wage in at him. So, in effect, you need to know and speak to him and say, look, if we take you to the end of this season, we need an assurance that you're not going to leave for free. And I don't, I don't think you're going to get that from any any Premier League player. And that that's that's the that's the big problem I've got here, lads, because I, I feel as if he he does sort of hold us to ransom. Um, as as much as I, look, I think he's a decent lad, I don't think he's the type that would do such a thing. But in this day and age, if you're Dominic Carvert Lewis, he's twenty seven years old now. Um he's played for England. He's been at now a club that has I think the last, well, he's gonna be coming on to four years, but at least the last three where he's played for a side that's been threatened relegation. At twenty seven years old, and again, if I'm not an Evertonian, 
I'd be looking to go somewhere else to succeed in my career. Um, and if he wants to do that, we're hamstrung by the fact that, well, the only option is to take a fee for him, surely. Because no, I don't think there's any other way around that, is the Paul? Well, it's not so much what he thinks. It's more what his agent thinks, isn't it? It's more what True. his agent's telling yeah. them. Because I don't think the, these negotiations are face-to-face between Tom and Carvalhoon. The negotiations yeah. are between Everson and, and, and Carvalhoon's agent. Now, you know, the quality of agent out there, I, I really wouldn't trust anyone, to be honest. But uh, so, 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 so the, the, that, that's your big decision. Now, I'm sure the agent's touting for bigger wages, a longer deal, and he'll be the one doing the negotiation. And eventually, we'll go back to Carvalhoon with what he considers to be the vice offer. So... I think that like the mo- most mo- modern footballers these days don't follow the hearts, they follow the agent's advice. So, yeah, it, it, it is a difficult situation. And I understand that Calvert-Lewin, it's a unique situation that he has 12 months of his contract left to run. I'll just go back to my original point that we hardly scored any goals last season. Yeah. And I'm just really worried that, it, you know, sometimes you, you might just ha- have to take a hit on something. Maybe you ha- might have to accept that someone's going to go in 12 months' time. But... If he has a successful season for us next year, if he gets his enough goals, then m- maybe you know, some financial losses you have to take. And compared to some of the other financial losses we made over the years, maybe they're not the worst one to uh, to deal with. Yeah, I think of, I think it's pretty to speak for, well, 99.999% here in saying that fans are happy to let Carvalhoon go for free if he assures that we're still a Premier League side that goes to Bramley Moore. Uh, which again is another another feeling of you know another emotion that many fans are going to have this season. Everything you watch at Goodison is the last, the last this, the last that, the last opponent, you know, the last time you, you're in your seat and all that sort of thing. Which I'm sure the club will end up selling to you for a ridiculous amount of money at the end of the season <laughs> as well. Um, but with with this situation we have, I, I do feel as if you know staying in the league is the priority here now. The, you know the, the other thing that could come into it, obviously, it's it's a lot further down the line. As you look at it in the Jan- January transfer window, if Everton in a healthy position, then you know it's a completely different place, completely different environment. We're in there in regards to what we need to to let go of. The other thing that's up in the air remains the ownership as well. Um, and you know the, the point you make keeps sticking in my mind there about you know if you if you get offered the money, then take it there, Paul. Because I'm starting to lean towards what you're saying there in terms of you keep. The goal scorer, arguably the only goal scorer we have at, by any means necessary, and I think sadly Evan are in that position. So, you know, if if somebody said to you, you can't bring another striker in, which is, I, I guess, is a possibility, a strong possibility that could happen, given that we would be loaning and probably we've said this before, haven't we? Money to spend and looking at a championship players much more than we're, we're shopping around Europe and looking for top class talent and able to pay 20, 30 million like we did with Beto. Um that's that's not realistic, is it? So you do have to bite the bullet. Would you agree with that, Pete? That if Everton stay in the Premier League, would you let Calvert Lewin go for free at the end of it? Again, I think it, it, it's 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 a type of conversation that we we wouldn't have been having a few years ago. Where a few years ago I would have said, "Yeah, just just keep him, you know, take the hit." But in this world of PSR and points deductions, um, I just don't think that the club can afford to. I think the club will be will have two hands tied behind the backs. I think that when you've seen the the commission hearing, certainly in the Knotts Forest case, where they went, they they argued that. The reason why they turned down a, an offer for was it Brennan was it Johnson was it? Um, oh, Forrest. He went to Tottenham. Yeah, yeah, yeah Forrest. Yeah, yeah. And, and he yeah. went to. And what what they tried to argue was that the reason they turned down twenty million was because they ended up getting you know three times that amount or whatever the figures were. Um, they they waited, they held out, and ended up getting more money. And I would have thought that that was actually quite a. You know, the same thing that happened with, with, to us with Richarlison, where we had to take probably less than what we valued him at because of this deadline. Um, I think because of those rules and because of everything else involved, I don't think we we can. I I, I don't think we can turn down an offer for Dominic Calvert Lewin. And um, the other thing as well, so you know, you touched on before about agents. Agents only make their money when players move. Um, they only you know the big money. You might get a little bit of a fee if they. They sign a new contract, but agents are always sniffing around trying to trying to put the, get deals through the through the door. They, they it, it's their bread and butter. It's how they make their money. They make money on bit on making moves. And certainly, if they can get Dominic Calvert Lewin to go to somewhere for twenty million, I'm sure the agents will be seeing 
another five or ten on top of that as well, yeah. because that's how they work. Um, I've, I've, got, coaches, um, but... I've got I've got a bit of a silly theory. It might not be my turn out to, to come fruition here, but Everton desperately needs financial capital to sort this out on the on the thirtieth. Yeah, if you're a club now looking at a player that you're interested in, Everton aren't selling anybody right now in the next nine days. You see it out, and then you come into Everton and say, "We want this player on the 29th. Are Everton not as gullible as you're ever going to see that see them to have to sell a player? Um, oh yeah, that's, that's, I'd, that's I'd, be that, I'd be that I'd be that cynical at this point, Paul. Yeah. I'd be that cynical. As yeah, the owner that, 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 that's that's modern football, Dave, isn't it? You know it's, exactly it's, it's, it is. Yeah, and, and and that's what that is a horrible scenario for us. But yes. that is why we're sort of we're sitting in the desert and and ready to be. Well, you know, uh, and cool. the, the the converse is we would do the same to other clubs who who would exactly, yeah. yeah, it's so it, game, it, yeah. It, it's doggy dog, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, it's what Man, it's what Man United have done with this thirty five million pound bid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because Man United have Man United have made that public as well. So basically, they can now turn around to Everton. The day before that, that cut off point and say, "Well, you you could have complied with PSR if you would have taken our offer." And yeah. The Premier League will know that. So here you go. We'll tell you what. We'll give you fifty. It's it's just. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th- that's a, that's all for another chat. We've had, had it loads of times, haven't we, about PSR and deductions and money back, getting points back, getting points taken off. Just hope it's not one of those seasons. Our last one at Goodison as well. I mean, the emotion is already attached to us for this season, regardless of what goes on off the pitch. And um, look, hopefully, new decent owners on the horizon. Um, we continue to hear progress on that every single day. I'm still refused to believe that these are decent people until I see them actually do something that's <laughs> decent. And I think, you know, if, if they're doing the due diligence of what fans are like at Everton as well, I don't think an Evertonian can be blamed for thinking these guys aren't the real the real deal here. You look at the seven 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 issue and all that as well. But we'll we'll call that a day, gents. Um be, being a really interesting chat about what's going on all over the place at the moment. Um, obviously, regards to all the family of Kevin Campbell as well. Um, it will all forever be in our hearts uh, at Goodison, and we get to Bramley Moor as well. I hope there's something built there as well to uh, for, for the legacy that he deserves, certainly for what he did for us to keep us in the Premier League as well. Um, thanks, boys. Thanks for your time. Thanks for everybody for listening, as always. Uh, for nobody that's listened to us across the summer. Get yourself a nice drink when you're sitting by a pool, wherever you've gone on holiday, and give us a listen, because we don't stop. Across summer, the mailbag's still going as well, um, if you just want to have a laugh with us. And yeah, every story that comes, even if it doesn't, we're on every single week doing the weekly. On Patreon as well, there's the subs weekly, loads of shows, transfers. Hopefully, we'll do loads of that as well. So stay with us on the Blue Room, and we'll speak to you again soon. Up the toffees. <laughs>